If you don't have the ammunition and the tools to excite your clients about why it makes sense for them to make this decision that they're nervous about, you're gonna fail. So go out and do some case studies, go out and get some proof sources and get the confidence up yourself so you can talk to them and excite them about moving forward. <laughs>the management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're in escrow. And you now can manage through the home advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's, it's all click of a button, guys. What's up, everybody? So today we got the great Carrie Shaw. It's been a while since we've had you on, Carrie. So uh, that's always a good thing, right? So we got Carrie on today, Saul, myself. Um, just kind of thinking about what we're going to talk about today. We start thinking about what the market's doing in 2023. Can you believe it? We're already at the end of February. It's like... You know, just a few minutes ago, we're just going to the new year. Now we're at the end of February. So trying to figure out where the market's heading. We're getting to the end of Q1 already. Uh, Saul, what's your what's your take on that? What do you think the market's doing? I mean, there is no national market. We know that. But there's some things that are trending pretty pretty consistently. Where do you see the market right now? Well, and, you know, we're still in this situation where there's probably not enough inventory for everybody. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's not enough inventory for everybody, it'll mask some of the economics. And so while it could get a lot worse than it is, we don't typically see that because there's just not enough inventory for people. And so we see interest rates are kind of going up, but then they come down a little bit. And so typically when that happens, you get a rush to the market. And then we hear that the economy is not as good as we thought it was. And then it goes up, it, it'll, prices will kind of moderate a little bit. And so it's this, still this uncertainty. And you're right, we're getting toward the end of the quarter and we're still not sure where 2023 is going to take us. Last year, we dropped from about what? Uh, was That's another thing is the last couple of years have been great years. And so a drop, and it could be a dramatic drop, it's still a dramatic drop from a very high, uh, from a mountaintop. Not a very good basis to set when you're looking at 2021. That's not, that's not a good baseline to set for your expectation. One thing I've been looking at too, usually we look at the market in either a buyer's market or a seller's market what this feels like to me and it's been this way the last six months almost a nobody's market and what i mean by that the inventory is low so there's not a lot of great options out there affordability is a killer right now all across the country if you're looking at the consumer debt and how fast that's going up q3 q4 and, and uh here in the across the country last year and probably what's happening right here in q1 credit card debt, HELOC debt, it's just rampant, like crazy, you know, 20 plus year highs. Uh, you know, look at the affordability index, which measures the ability of people buy houses in the US. The affordability index is really out of whack right now. So whose market is it anyway? It seems like a nobody market. We don't have a like a crash where the prices have crashed. To me, it feels like we have a drought, a low opportunity market for both buyers and sellers. And for me, I don't know about you, maybe I'll ask Carrie this, but how do you feel like the agents react to that when it feels like there's low opportunity? How does that, how do the agent population respond when they're used to their salespeople, like enthusiasm, they like to go, they like things to work out. They like, they have some opportunity to chase. How do agents react to this? I think what I'm seeing right now is that, uh, agents are feeling disempowered. They're feeling nervous. They're not really sure what skills they need to shift. But I see a lot of people who are showing up, like if I just look at my team for an example, you know, they're showing up to get help. And we just had an event in Florida and we had agents showing up to learn. Um, I was at Agent Academy, which was an event in Fort Lauderdale and hundreds of agents showed up. So I think they're hungry to learn, which is probably why those of you that are watching this today or in the future when it's posted are here. But I think a lot of times people are talking about how to build pipeline, 
right? How, mm -hmm. oh, go do this prospecting activity and do this and do this. And the problem is a lot of agents are spinning their wheels and it's making them feel like they're not getting the transactions and the actual ratifications that they're used to getting for the amount of work they're doing. And then that's causing some agents who are really talented to leave the industry. So when, when I was brainstorming things that I thought would add value for the group today, one of the things I wanted to talk about was getting commitment from clients. A lot of people are going into these meetings and they're chatting and they're becoming friends and they're building rapport. And that's what they did that worked really well for the last mm -hmm. few years. And they don't have the edge that they need to take a hesitant buyer that's on the fence about whether they're ready to get commitment. And so- yeah. And, and on top of that, Carrie, you're on a roll. I love what you're saying right now. But just to, to add to that, I think part of the problem, and I agree with you, I think agents right now are trying to figure out, well, where's how do I build a business? What's working before isn't working right now. I'm having trouble building a pipeline. I'm having trouble converting. So they're trying to figure out how to adjust, right? And that's not even talking about the agents that do what I like to call opportunity hopping, where they just attach themselves to some new opportunity. I'm going to jump brokerages, jump teams. There's this new lead generator over here. I'm going to jump on all these people I can attach you for opportunity because they've never really built the business themselves. I'm not even talking about that agent. I'm talking about the ones that have kind of built the pipeline, but now what they did before isn't working as well. Mm -hmm. And and I think you're hitting it right in the head because the conversations are changing. Um, you know, the, the complexity of what it takes to move from house A to house B, selling the house that you have with your really low interest rate, high equity, looking out there and you don't see much that really inspires you, but you feel like maybe you have to move or should you really move? How do I make this work? There's a complexity out there that wasn't there a couple of years ago. And I think the conversations need to change and perhaps they haven't enough. Are we solving the real problems that are out there? Are we talking about the real problems? Do we have solutions for them? You know, are we, are we true uh, consultants out there right now, not professional door owners? I think some of those things are, are playing a factor. Yeah, no, are we creating... Go ahead, Saul. I was going to say, are you saying that we're not getting, people don't know how to close anymore? And so uh, is that what we're talking about here? People just don't, because they didn't have to close for so long. And so now they're not closing. And you know, closing is an old uh, skill. And having to close in a sales environment is something people have had to do for years and years, but maybe a large portion of the aging population hasn't had to do this. And now they need to look for, uh, ways to learn how to actually close when they're with a hot prospect. Yes. Or when they're with a lukewarm prospect, that's not sure what they want to do. Uh, I was, I was sharing with my agents this morning uh, in a little fit of rage that I them want to see saying, rage. I want to see what that looks like. Yeah, me in a fit of rage is like yeah. passion. I'm like, guys, if somebody tells you like when my agents say to me, oh, I met with this buyer. They loved me. Yeah, they're not quite ready to get started yet though. So they didn't sign the buyer agreement because we're going to get started in six months. I'm like, no, they didn't love you. They did not commit to you. So what they told you is no, they dissed you. And you're telling yourself that it went well. It didn't. Because so you had the opportunity to get someone to commit to using you and you didn't have the skill to make that happen. And so I've been dissecting all of the sales training. I, I started my career in new home sales training and it was absolutely amazing. We went through a course called professional selling skills and some of those basic skills, actually isolating objections, like mm -hmm. You have to be good at that and not just one time in the sales process at every point in the funnel. Over and right? over. Yep. You have to be good at it when the call comes in to convince the person to have a meeting. And there's a few, there's a few like very tactical techniques and tips that I have right now. So one of them is when you're on the phone with the prospect and you 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 get them live, like we all know you have to dial a lot to get someone live on the phone. You've mm -hmm. got to leverage that opportunity for those people who get live conversations and the person says, oh, I'm busy right now. Can you call me back? You have to say, absolutely, I'd be happy to call you back. Why I have you? Let me ask you a quick question. Are you still thinking about moving in the next three to six months? Mm -hmm. Like, don't just set up all these follow-up conversations. And I still monitor. I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I'm like, I like to have my heartbeat on the pulse of my agents and what they're experiencing. 
So I still get a daily report from all of my ISAs where I get to look at the conversations they're having to learn the objections that we as a team need to isolate better. And this is the number one thing I'm hearing right now. Oh, can you call me back? I'm busy. And instead of the pivot to move them through to book the appointment in that moment, some of these agents are just being too nice. They're, oh, yes, sure. What time works for you? Mm -hmm. No, they're going to see your number and go, I don't have time to deal with that right now because we're all busy human beings, right? So then it, when you look at the sales funnel, it carries on to the appointment. So let's imagine that they managed to book the appointment. They're going and a lot of agents, in my opinion, are spending too much time building rapport. We were joking around about this earlier. You know, they're talking about the pets they have, the bars they like to go to, how cool their shoes are. They have a great haircut, like all these things. And they're not getting to the nitty gritty of the process, the market, what the people want, the questions they have. As an agent, they're never getting a chance to show value either, right? Because that's one of the, the the things that sets agents apart is, can I show value very quickly? And I can build a rapport and I can get to know all about you, your name, where you went to school, your spouse's name, all these cool things, but I still haven't even touched on what your plans are with real estate, you know, what your objectives are, what you would like to accomplish, where, what is it right now, but where you live that you're not so happy about, you want to change it. I don't know these things because I'm not, I'm not asking the right questions. It all comes down again to the right questions. When you say objections, I want to be, I want to pull this out too, because I think when Saul says the old school way of closing, like we got to get back to closing. I think there's a, there's a moral change uh, to the way people view closing. I mean, you think of somebody back in, you know, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and you think like, use car salesman closing, like sleazy sales techniques. And, and I don't want to, you know, generalize that way, but that's just sort of what comes to mind with a lot of agents. And I know this because I talk to a lot of agents and they don't want to feel like salespeople, but I think there's a way to be closing and handle objections moralistically. Cause a lot of these objections are rooted in misunderstanding, misconception, fear, things like they want to do something. They need you to tell them how to, if yes. you can pull the objection out, get to the core, root core of it. This isn't sales where you're trying to get them to do something they don't want to do. This is fine trying to figure out what their misconceptions are, what their gaps in knowledge and, and ignorances are, so you can kind of move things forward for them. So this, yeah. is always, this has always been the case. Sales is helping. And so mm -hmm. really, if you're in the real estate business, you are in sales. Sales is a piece of that. But it's also, as you mentioned earlier, it's also about being consultative. It's mm -hmm. about knowing the right questions to ask. And at the same time, you have to understand that it is a sales process and that people do give you signals when they're ready to buy, when they're ready to close. And so you have to be alerted to those things. But it's not like being a used car salesman. It's like being a counselor. And that's, that's always what people need to be, you need to be a counselor. And the people that are really successful in real estate sales over generations, the ones I've seen are people that are really counselors, right? And really, and really have a heart and really are trying. And then you ask them, what do you like about the real estate business? And I'll tell you, I love it because I'm helping people. And that's what sales really is. It's helping people. And sometimes they don't even know what they're looking for. And you're going to consult and you're going to pull that out of them. Right. And which, which then again, Saul, that's exactly my point, right? When they don't know. So we ask the wrong question. Sometimes we're talking about what would you like? What's in a perfect world? Which house would you like? Describe it to me. They don't know. So right then it becomes the wrong question. What I love about what Carrie's talking about, though, is how when you can kind of pull these objections out, get to the root cause of things, figure out where they're really at, you know, and, and maybe what you can do then when you talk about objection handling. And, and I do want to point this out, too. I think that sales thing I'm talking about, it's a stigma when you hear sales. It's just this stigma of I need to take a moral shower because sales is gross, right? It's it's not. This is consultative service. It's sales and service. It's high level, high need, high touch service. With well, and can I say something about that? Yes. Like, yep. When people are like, "Oh, I don't want to be in sales," I'm like, "Okay, then you need to go get another job. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you're going to fail. You're not going to make money because you have to be able. What to me in our business right now." People are super uncomfortable. They're, they have so yeah. much uncertainty. And we are doing them a massive disservice, letting them sit in their uncertainty. They have a need. There are people who are having babies that have them like living in a crib in a closet. Mm -hmm. There are people who are trapped in an environment that's not conducive to have a supportive marriage, happy children. There are life situations, people who want to get divorced that literally need you to hold their hand and say, I've got you. You're going to be yep. okay. Right? Yep. 
So in my career, what the feedback that clients have always given me is like, Carrie, you just give us so much confidence, right? And it's because I make it easy to say yes. The people who are just focused on building rapport, they don't make it easy to say yes. The people mm -hmm. are still nervous about the market. They're still nervous about how they're going to afford what they want to buy and how they're going to sell their house and how everything's going to work. So I always teach my agents, you want to be likable but you wanna be professional and you wanna guide the client to understand your unique value and how you're going to solve their problems. So they're very confident hiring you, whether they're gonna buy in three months, six months or a year, they know you're their person, right? The only way you do that, in my opinion, is by having a firm sales process, right? Mm -hmm. And in, the, in your buyer intake process, when you sit down with the client, you need to be crystal clear on their priorities, but not just about the house, because really we're consultants, but we're also like psychologists, right? If we can't effectively understand what somebody's not saying so we can truly solve their problems, we're not that good of salespeople because somebody is going to tell you, I want a five bedroom, three bathroom house. And you're doing the math and you're looking mm -hmm. and you're going, okay, they're going to end up in a three bedroom house and they're not getting a garage, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Every time you have to, if you're a talented agent, you don't tromp them through a bunch of houses to get them to come to the conclusion that they need to be looking at three bedroom houses. You listen to how they're going to use each of those bedrooms and you solve their problem. Mm -hmm. Then you're able to do that and guide the client using a data driven process to understand your value and how you're going to present results to them and how you're going to help them to get everything they want that they can afford, all of a sudden it becomes easy for them to move forward, right? I've seen so many agents that just they, oh yeah, that sounds beautiful. That's gonna, oh, that's gonna be great. Well, it doesn't exist in the world. So right. then you're never gonna get the deal done if you're not effective at gathering the information, normalizing the differences that couples have, because let's face it, one of them wants to live on a horse farm and the other one's a condo in the city and you've got to find the middle ground and you've got to get there fast or you're going to lose their interest and they're going to fight, right? I think, I think what you said is really important in this regard too, because as you know, when you really do real estate at a high level, you have a sales process. And I like the, the reason I keep going back to that world, people, that word sales, people have such a negative stigma with that. It is, it is sales. So you can't, yeah, you can't get that's around what, it. That's what I'm saying. I want people to understand sales doesn't mean something bad. So when you hear it, it's, there's a stigma that doesn't have to be. We have sales processes, right? If we're going to be operating at real estate at a high level, we got a process. The buyer themselves also has a process. They just don't know it. They don't know what they want. How many times have you met a buyer that has no idea what they want? They can't articulate it. They're off, way off in a different world. And for that situation, like you said, that the buyer wants to do something in six months, how about nine months, a year, whatever it is, really good salespeople can take them through that process you know, and get them going in two months, three months, four months, it shortens the cycle for that buyer. And then you get them to where they actually want to go. They just don't, through a series of self-discovery they haven't done yet, they haven't got there. That's right. our job, we help them get there. Um, you know, so that's that's just what I want to make sure that, uh, that, that we call out that, you know, because uh, I do agree with you, Carrie. I think right now the agent that knows how to have an actual process, knows the right questions to ask, has the right solutions to people's problems, can identify what people aren't saying as well as what they are saying. And then, you know, in an empathetic way, high emotional intelligence, be able to handle that situation. Um, that's going to be the agent that's going to win right now, rather than what you just mentioned with the professional door opener saying, oh, it sounds great. Let's go find that house. Go ahead, Saul. It, it's, not, it's not about find, about forcing somebody into something they don't want. That's not what nope. this is. Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> This is a process of learning and understanding, and that's selling. And mm -hmm. you want to be a true sales professional, and you need a process to do that. And I go back to selling is helping if you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. if you're consulting, and and yes, you can get somebody through something that might take six months in a shorter period of time if that's in their best interest, because you're always trying to work in their best interest, but you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to figure this out unless you ask the right question. We used to call them trial closes. And, but the fact is you ask a question to learn something. Mm -hmm. you don't, just don't ask a question to ask a question. And if you're good at this, and like you said, you have a process, 
to where you have certain questions and you'll learn the more you do this, that there are questions you can ask to get more information to be able to help people determine what it is they're looking for. And having said that, people, you never find your dream home, really. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. After you've lived in a home for a while, you, you say, you know what? I really needed a light over the bed. I need to now install a light. I need to remodel. I need to change. So the idea that you're going to find the perfect home, well, that doesn't really exist for people, right? They get into what they need right now, and that will change over time. And you, you are, as the salesperson, really the consultant, right? Mm -hmm. You are the person that helps them find and fulfill their needs. It's needs-based. Well, and like to get back to tactics, I think that it's important when you're having this conversation, like agents in 2021 were like, let's go buy a house, right? And people were like, yeah, sounds great. Now, when you go all the way, you set a trial close. And that, that triggered something in me that I feel like it's important to share. When I'm talking to a client, I'm looking at their personality type. I'm sure you guys have all heard of the DISC personality oh, yeah. type. If you're somebody who's watching this and you haven't, just go on YouTube. It's super simple. Type in DISC sales training and watch the videos and they'll teach you how to sell a printer or how to sell a car or how to sell a house. It doesn't matter. It's about being able to identify the type of person that you're talking to. So those trial closes match what's going to make them feel comfortable. So I think for all of us, the hardest person to close is a C because they're very analytical and they're mm -hmm. very nervous about making a mistake, particularly in a high interest rate market, right? They're mm -hmm. like, oh, but if the interest rates go up, the prices are gonna go down and they're not thinking about supply and demand. They're, they look at data in, in like little stripes because they're so afraid that they have a hard time seeing the big picture sometimes, right? So if I'm talking to somebody like that and they tell me that they're six to 12 months out, I'm not arguing about why they should do it now. Absolutely not. I'm not trying to get them all the way to agree to buy a house. All I'm trying to do is help them feel comfortable that I'm the right person to navigate each step of the process. And I'm going to try and future pace what I'm going to teach them at various times. Right. Mm -hmm. So on my team, when we get, when we get done with the buyer consultation, we have them sign an agreement. Now, some of you guys are like, oh, well, people in my market don't do that. Bullshit. Mm -hmm. People do it all over the country. Yes, they do. It's simply that you're not presenting enough value to have them feel comfortable hiring you. Now, mm -hmm. we write in our buyer, we call it a loyalty agreement, okay? Why? Because if you say, now sign this contract, people are like, whoa, I'm scared about mm -hmm. that. If you say, you know, do you feel confident I'm the right agent to help you, Mike, when the time is right? Mm -hmm. That's low pressure, right? When the time is right. I'm not saying it's time for you to buy a house right now. I'm saying, do you feel confident in me? And I think a lot of agents, instead of saying, do you feel confident in me? They say, so how does that sound? Like, oh, are you excited about the next steps? They view that as a close. That is not a close. They are well, hiring you as their you know, agent. So speaking of confidence, Carrie, the one thing that I see with agents too, when it comes time to sign that agreement, they're so nervous and uncomfortable with it themselves. How are you going to make the, how are you make the client feel comfortable with it when you're the one that's not comfortable with it? Right. I didn't get across and you're like, I really don't want to do this, but I, I got to do this. And, you know, I've seen that blow up in agents face so much, but if they're confident and they believe in their own value and they believe that they're the best choice for that person, it changes the conversation. And if they are going to do the work. So here's Correct. the thing, when I'm talking to a client and I'm getting their commitment to work with me, I'm explaining to them, listen, you shared with me that you are willing to be flexible for the next six to 12 months. That's my ideal situation for a client because I'm able to go out and door knock and drop letters. Once we go through our reality check analysis, which that's the third part of our process. Once we go through that, we're going to identify exactly what you're looking for. And I'm going to go out and find it for you before those sellers ever put their home on the market. And that's part of how I'm going to support giving you the right opportunities. Isn't that exciting? Like, I'm so excited about the work I'm going to do for people and having time to do it is wonderful, right? So then they know, well, I need to hire Carrie now. And if they say, well, I'm not comfortable signing an agreement, I say, you know what? I completely understand in most contracts or scary agreements, it can make you feel really nervous. This is a loyalty agreement. And you'll see right here, it says you can cancel it at any time. I'm going to be earning your business every single day. And if I ever let you down, you send me a text, 
you send me an email, you let me know. But if I'm going to spend my nights and weekends going and knocking on doors and dropping off letters, I want to know that I have your loyalty. Does mm -hmm. that sound fair to you? They're like, well, yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'm Correct. super excited to work together. So I'm going to have you go ahead and sign here. And they do it. Like, I don't have a bunch of people who say, no, I'm not going to do that. Never have, never will. Why? So, Carrie, so you have a script. So you have a process. Right? I have an exact process and, and I have so, value. And so, yeah, so you build value in the process. And so I would say somebody watching this, they would want to know, well, at what point are you comfortable enough? Do you feel your client? What day is it? What encounter is it? The third, where, the when meeting. do you do this? So it's the very first meeting when I don't ask them to sign it over the phone, right? I've talked to people who say, oh, I have a Zoom meeting and I make them sign before we get together. That's not my process. I have the initial call. I schedule the consultation. I meet with them. Step one is the needs analysis. Step two is our buyer presentation. And before I move to step three, which is our reality check analysis, I get the buyer agreement signed. Right after they've just got really excited about the process, about how we provide off-market properties, the process we use to get them, all that value, then it's like their emotion, if you've done the presentation well, they feel really excited. That's when you have them sign and then you move right into going through the last 90 days of sales. So it's like, it's formulaic. And our process continues that way through showing houses, through helping them understand all the details. So I guess the most important thing I can say to people who are watching is have a process where you are helping the client have clarity and part of their clarity is that you're the right person to support them. If they're not willing to sign an agreement, something is not right. And you need to have more sales training because you spending money on leads, you going out and working to get your SOI comfortable with you. All of those behaviors are not going to lead to sales in this environment without the right process. You're I'm glad you brought that up too. Leads. I'm glad you brought that up, Carrie, because the whole thing started here because we we're talking about the difference in opportunity today than where it was, you know, six months ago, eight months ago, a year ago plus. And with the amount of high buyer demand, uh, with the amount of people that were so excited about going out and buy a house, it's different today. Like I said, it's a low, it's a low opportunity environment for both buyers and sellers. And if you're gonna have less opportunity, you have to have a higher close rate. Yes. You know, it's harder to find people that actually can or are willing to do something or would like to, but they're still afraid to or don't know what's going on. When you have that opportunity, you have to have a better close rate because if you don't, you have to have like 300% more opportunity than you did to get the same results you had before. That's the and problem. For, for a lot of agents, they're saying, my SOI isn't doing anything right now. Big right. producers are telling me like, yep. I don't know what to do. I need to start generating leads. I've never needed to generate leads in my life. Well, guess right. what, guys? If you start paying a cost per lead and you're not closing, it's harder to close online leads than your SOI. So mm -hmm. the first thing you need to do is look internally and say, what do I need to shift and how I'm presenting the opportunity to buy, right? Then I know we're out of time, but I have to share this. I just did a case study that's on my personal life, okay? So I'm going to tell you the numbers, the approximate numbers here. I looked at if I never moved up, because in my ideal client, I'm looking at the client avatars I want to work with. How many of us want to work with move up buyers? So we're getting to sell their house and help them buy another house. All of us, it's two transactions, right? So I'm thinking what data would help them get confidence? So I looked at if I still owned my very first condo, what I would have made per year in equity. I would have made $3,300 a year in equity if I still owned that condo and that's what I was selling today. But I didn't, I moved up to a townhouse. So then I looked at, well, what would I have made in equity a year if I were to sell that townhouse today? $28,000 a year. That's pretty good, right? An extra $28,000 a year. But I didn't. I bought and built a single family home. So I looked at if I sold that today, what's the equity? $77,000 a year is what the equity is on that move up purchase. So what's the moral of that story when you're sharing this with your clients? Never did I mention interest rate. The interest rate is irrelevant. To refinance. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful, Carrie. What you just did, I'm actually going to coin that. That's a brilliant thing you just did. I'm going to coin that myself as equity acceleration. I'm going to make a whole program behind that. But yes, yes, it really is. you're accelerating the rate your equity grows by having the better asset. That's all yes. you're doing. Love and that. 
And by the way, like the end of that story is I ended up with an asset that I paid. The, it was a hundred percent finance because my husband has a VA loan mm -hmm. and I paid a hundred percent of my mortgage for the last two and a half years, plus had cash flow on a hundred percent loan by Airbnb being that asset, because there's not a lot like it in the market because it's at Love the it. top of the pyramid, right? Love so it. that's a whole nother case study. But the point is, if you don't have the ammunition and the tools to excite your clients about why it makes sense for them to make this decision that they're nervous about, you're going to fail. So go out and do some case studies, go out and get some proof sources and get the confidence up yourself so you can talk to them and excite them about moving forward. Because information creates confidence. And if you're not confident yourself, why would your clients be confident to work with you or to move forward? So that's one thing that I keep telling my agents to spend more time in research and development. If you're not as busy right now, figure out where you can learn things that are going to help you close at a higher rate. Um, the other thing I was going to say too, uh, you know, because you said something that that really, really kind of got me thinking. If you did that same analysis for your SOI, because one thing I think those people that are struggling with the SOI, I don't want to, I don't want to assume because I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but so many agents don't really have a follow up plan with their SOI, or if they do, they're no. just calling to check in. That's all they're doing, right? So that might have worked before, but when you're providing value to your SOI. And some people will provide some value, like every year they'll give them a, you know, sort of unsolicited CMA of their house, right? That's about as much as you're going to do. But when you have bigger, more valuable pieces that you're putting in front of your, your clients, one, like I said, that equity acceleration piece, I would share that as a case study with my SOI and say, let's evaluate your asset. Is there something else we could put you in that's going to accelerate your equity faster, better? I mean, that's valuable. That's good stuff. Is anybody having those conversations with their SOI? You know, those type of assessments on a yearly basis with people, oh, you can just think of the opportunity or the possibilities that come with that kind of thing. So, so once you create your piece, will you share it with me? I think I will. You're going to have to remind me on that. But yes, I love this. I, this, like, this is a good thing. I got me thinking now. Okay. So, um, yeah, you're back to, you, it's a process. And it's not just a process with the buyer. It's a process with your sphere of influence as well, right? So you have different processes with different people that you work with. And yeah. A lot of folks in the industry, because a lot of people have come in when it, all you had to do is find the property and then, right, there'd be 12 offers on it. So you really didn't have to do this kind of thing. But now it becomes more important. And you're right, Mike, that you have to be more efficient when you're working with an opportunity because yeah. you don't, right? Otherwise, you have to find a lot more opportunities. And that's hard right now. A lot harder. Yes. Um, all right, ladies Indeed. and gents, we are over time. I could go on and on with you guys. Uh, Carrie, great seeing you. We'll catch you guys Thank on the next you. one. All right. Sounds good. Bye, you guys. Bye.